I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that, you, that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I have laid down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, I suspect that we as Christians, and not just we in this room, but we as Christians more broadly, have a deep lack of spiritual imagination. We lack the ability to actually comprehend what is going on in Christ, and then spend a lot of time trying to replicate things we understand because we cannot wrap our heads around the amazing thing that Christ, frankly, lays out here in John chapter 10. A couple of years back, there was one of those, you know, faith-based news stories that blow up that uh, a, a church in Arizona was having to, a Catholic church in Arizona, was having to invalidate years' worth of baptisms. That these people had gone, they'd been baptized uh, by the priest in the church because the priest had used one word incorrectly. Instead of saying, I baptize in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he said, we baptize in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in changing that one word, he apparently invalidated the baptismal process. And so all these people got letters saying, hi, yes, uh, you uh, thought you were baptized. Um, it turns out that, uh, no, you are not baptized uh, because uh, one guy uh, used one word uh, incorrectly. Uh, therefore, uh, hey, if like, I know that makes like things really complicated, uh, but you're going to need to come in and get baptized again. And, and I don't, I'm not picking on any particular denomination. I'm just saying we are so used to a world where like we deal with broken bureaucracies, right? That you file your taxes. And if you put this one thing, if you put it in schedule two and schedule three, if you submit the wrong form to the wrong people, you could end up owing the government thousands of dollars. We're very used to this. Maybe this week, particularly used to this, that then we imagine our religion, we imagine our relationship with God as the same way. That if the exact words are not used in the exact way, if you don't submit the correct paperwork to the correct people, the whole religious experience can get undone. Because we know broken bureaucracies... And we have a hard time imagining good shepherds. For ancient people, it was a little different. They did not have our massive paperwork-obsessed world, but what they had were ruthless emperors. And so when they imagined God, they imagined a ruthless emperor. And then when Jesus turns out to be the opposite of a ruthless emperor, turns out to be Lord of Lords, yes, and Prince of Peace, People are confused, shocked, dismayed that he doesn't roll in and run a military conquest on the Romans, that instead he dies for his people, rises on the third day, and sets up a spiritual kingdom that becomes an earthly kingdom that is truly the salvation and transformation of the world. Like, we can only imagine bureaucracy and thus want to invalidate spiritual experiences because this group used the wrong words, or this group prays a different prayer than us, or this group looks real different than us, so they're clearly out. They imagined ruthless emperors and were then shocked when that's not who Jesus turned out to be. It is a profound lack of spiritual 
imagination. Because Jesus tells us who he is here. And Jesus tells us, essentially, how this works. He says this over and over again. There are two lines he repeats over and over again in this scripture. I am the good shepherd. I lay my life down for my flock. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays his life down for the flock. I am the good shepherd. Good shepherd lays his life down for the flock. No one makes me do this. I choose to do this. And by the way, I have the power to rise again. At the core, this gets at who Jesus is for us. Jesus is an entirely different kind of leader. An entirely different way of working in the world. We are used to leaders who will want people to die for them. Nope, Jesus died for us. We are used to, you know, shepherds don't don't actually lead the flock. They make money off their flock. They make a living off of either shaving their flock, milking their flock, or killing parts of their flock. That is actually how shepherds make money. This is, I'm not a, clearly not a farmer. I'm from the suburbs. But even I know that only one of three things are happening to their sheep. Milking, shearing, or eating. So when Jesus is a good shepherd, it's an entirely different kind of shepherd. It's a shepherd who views his sole purpose as the love and care of his flock. So much so that rather than sacrifice a member of the flock for his own well-being, he will sacrifice himself for the flock and its well-being. This is not actually how shepherding works, but this is actually how Jesus works. He is the good shepherd. He lays his life down for the flock. He raises it up again. And in that way, we can be as close to him as he is to God the Father. It's pretty incredible. And... Pretty simple, actually. It's not that complicated. There is no paperwork implied in this. There are no special formulas implied with this. Merely a shepherd who loves his flock so much that he will do literally anything possible to be close to and in relationship with that flock. This is the essence of grace. Not to build new barriers, but to get rid of barriers and allow us all to come to Christ, to know the good, illogical, amazing, loving, gracious shepherd. The second half of this It's the bit that people uh, latch onto and love to get confused by. Um, Picking up, where are we? Sorry. There we go. Verse 16. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. One of those places where we, this is another one of those places where we lack a spiritual imagination. We are, as humans have always been, since time immemorial, separated by whatever, by nationalities, by ethnicities, by distance, by ideologies. There's all these things that separate us off. And so when we imagine a relationship with God, we then also imagine a relationship with God that where we are all separated off and we're all just in little boxes and you're over in this box and this box is not connected to this box and it all does not look like one body, one flock, one shepherd. It looks like, I don't know, a few thousand different flocks with one shepherd hoping to God that they'll all come together someday. It's not that complicated. It is far simpler. One shepherd one flock. What matters has nothing to do with us and everything to do with God's desire to love us. God's desire 
to be in relationship with us. Christ's desire to be our good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He wants to be our good shepherd. And so, friends, we need to expand our spiritual imagination. We need to stretch our spiritual minds to see beyond how we think the world should work, how we are used to the world working in all of its broken systems of bureaucracies and empires and divisions and all of these things that have nothing to do with God and everything to do with us. (coughs) We need to set aside and expand our minds and our souls to begin to comprehend what is actually going on here. There is a God and a Savior who wants you. Doesn't matter who you are. Wants you, me too, thank God, to be a part of the flock. To be as close to him as he is to God the Father. And if you don't submit all the right paperwork, if someone didn't say all the right words, Jesus is going to go, yeah, that's okay. You tried. You got close. I love you. I want you in this flock. And if you go, well, I don't think I fit in this flock. I'm from those other people. You go, that's okay, good. We're trying to get all of the people together into one flock. So that works out great. Come on in to the one flock. You may be as close to me as I am to the Father. That we all may share in the glory of God. And that we don't impose our visions, our broken visions from a world that's not yet as it it should be. And impose that onto God. Because God's far better than all of that. And part of having belief in a Savior is having a belief in the character of God and that the ways of God are not the ways of this world, that the ways of God don't resemble the brokenness we've got to navigate all the time, that it is simply about love, about love for all of us, about wanting to be connected to all of us and all of us having an opportunity to be connected directly to God and to be directly connected to one another in one flock. It's real simple. We're the ones who complicate it. We're the ones who add levels. Jesus shows up and tries to tear down all the complications. And then we build it back up because we love it. We love the complications. It's all we can imagine. And it is, in fact, far simpler. Imagine that world where we all know God's love, where we all know we have access to that love. We all know that despite whatever separates us, we are part of one flock. That world sounds great. That is the actual world we live in now because God is present here with us. May we have this belief, this belief in God's character, this belief in a good shepherd, a shepherd that loves us so much that rather than expecting us to die for his profit, he is willing to die solely for our gain, who then did in fact die solely for our gain, rises on the third day and opens this flock up to whoever wants to be a part of of it. That is our Savior. That is Christ. That is God's character playing out in the person of Christ. May we know that in our souls. And may we place our souls into that Savior's hands. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we give you thanks 
We give you thanks that your ways are not our ways, but the way you want to love us tears down all of those barriers. That Christ died for us even when we did not have it all together yet, rose on the third day to be our good shepherd so that we may be a part of that flock. God, stir up in us a desire to claim that for ourselves, to see ourselves in that flock, to know that love, and to be transformed by that grace. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.